Although New Orleans, back in the days when jazz was born, was the city of revivalist dreams, we were about to awake with a shock to its living musical reality. In 1949, a band was formed by a London train cleaner, Ken Collier. It was called the Crane River Jazz Band, a harmless enough name, but it was to split the revivalist jazz world. Ken called his music traditional jazz. The war was on. Ken believed that the basis of revivalism, the jazz recordings made during the 20s by musicians who'd quit New Orleans, was a decadent development. He maintained that true jazz had never left the Crescent City. His idol was Bunk Johnson, an old and obscure New Orleans trumpet player, long retired, who was rediscovered in the late 30s. And then, until his death in 1949, Bunk became a living legend. Ken believed this to be the true jazz. There was no other. When I first cottoned on to Bunk, I admit, I slavishly tried to copy him. But Bunk was a wonderful teacher, which I realized it wasn't just to try and copy them. And it really is a waste of time just being a carbon, becoming a carbon copy of anybody. Following Bunk's example, Collier formed a strictly traditional New Orleans band as he conceived it. And I had to drill it into them men. They weren't uh, avid about the music like I was at the time, but I coerced them and influenced them. <laughs> I don't know today whether it was ever to their regret, but uh, it was my personality and driving force that made the band what it was. You were a tremendous influence. Many musicians who'd been happily playing revivalist jazz moved over to playing traditional jazz. Yes, but it's a, an unfortunate thing, in a way, that the, the jazz world became so partisan. I mean, it wasn't a good thing at all, but that's the way it happens. You had your avid people that believed only Louis Armstrong's Hot Five and Hot Seven, and that was the only way to play. And so Jelly Roll Morton, that was the only way to play. And then the, there was all this conflict within the jazz scene, which I, was a shame because conflict like that wastes a lot of energy and a lot of time that could be put to better use. Yeah. Although you were in part responsible for that. Conflict. Yes. But what finally <laughs> won the war for the traditionalists was a gesture on the part of the movement's founder, Ken Collier. In retrospect, it appears almost inevitable. These men were still playing in New Orleans. They weren't all that old. And they must still be there and still playing. So the logical thing was to get there while they were still playing. And the only way I could think of doing this at the time was to rejoin the Merchant Navy and somehow or other find a boat that took me to New Orleans. They were looking for crew for this Empire Petrae, which was sailing out of Mobile, Alabama. And as soon as I heard Mobile, Alabama, I oh, that's near enough. <laughs> so I don't take any more chance. You know, this is as near as I'm going to get. So I deserted the ship and got the Greyhound bus to New Orleans. It was a very strong color bar then. How did you get over that? The color bar was very strict at the time, and there were problems. But I've often felt that it's the old saying, fools go where angels fear the treads. And I took chances sometimes. And even the band did, though, because they were aware you know, the color thing was a problem, but I did eventually manage to play with George Lewis. Playing with the heroes that you admired from afar, did it confirm you in your belief and did you feel you learnt a lot from it? Well, that's why I went there, was to confirm the courage of my convictions. I thought, well, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but am I? It's the only way to find out is to go there and play with these men. And they fully restored my faith in humanity, music and everything. 
When Ken Collier arrived back from New Orleans, he found a band waiting for him, a band willing to go professional and to play strict New Orleans jazz. It had been formed initially by Chris Barber, a trombonist who'd been around since the beginning of the revival, and it included Monty Sunshine on clarinet and Lonnie Donegan on banjo. And then we heard that Ken Collier's come back from New Orleans. He'd been overstayed his permit, been deported, first class, and there's America, lovely way of getting back. And um, so we wrote a letter saying, listen, we've got this band. What about coming and joining us? We'll call the band your band. Why not? Because you're the new, you're, you've come up from New Orleans. Everyone wants to see what you play. They all know what we play already. So back he came, and he came along and joined in our rehearsals, and, and it was ever so good. Uh, it really went very, very well. A combination, perhaps, of, 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 of the classic side of jazz and the, and, and the revived archaic side together just worked. And it did something. It had, uh, as they say in showbiz, magic of some kind and clicked. But magic or not, it didn't last. Ken soon decided, for a mixture of personal and musical reasons, to sack the rhythm section. But Chris pointed out he was not in a position to do so. On the contrary. So we thought, you know, this is a bit silly. So we turned around within about five minutes and said, listen, uh, sorry about this. It happens to be a cooperative band you may, you, which you joined. You may remember that. You may have forgotten that, but it's a partnership with the band. You can't sack anybody because it's a six-man partnership. And uh, what, But the other five of us, are now sacking you. Goodbye. Leave. You've got two weeks. Um, so, uh, two weeks later, he did. Luckily for Barber, a trumpet player called Pat Halcox, whom he'd long admired, decided to pack in his day job and go professional. The Chris Barber band was complete. <laughs> Based initially on Collier's traditionalism, it was somehow less rough and more accessible in impact. It began to attract a wide following and comparatively early to dilute Ken's strict ideas. It was the first true British trad band and was to spawn a host of imitators. Yet before trad jazz was to triumph, there was to be a short period in the wilderness. 1955 saw the emergence of the first wave of British rock and roll.